the church right now is going through an incredibly perilous time uh, internally and externally. The church is facing external threats from movements like secular humanism, atheism, um, progressivism, all these movements that you've heard of. And we're also facing internal threats. Um, we're facing radical theology that has nothing to do with the Bible. We're going against what's been dubbed progressive Christianity. We're going against things like the prosperity gospel. All these movements inside the church and outside the church pose a significant threat. They need answers. They We need people to defend against them. And one of the failures of the church has been that it hasn't educated its people on doctrine. The only way to properly respond to threats, internal and external, is with true and right doctrine. And that's what the Book of Roman is. The Book of Roman is arguably, in the entire Bible, the foremost doctrinal book. Romans is a book of steady and true doctrine. It's tried and true. Paul in Romans takes the message of the gospel and makes it alive. He makes it real. He shows us what it truly means. And that's what Romans is. It's doctrine and it's the gospel. And that is what we need in our culture more than anything else today. Doctrine and the gospel. That's the only way we'll be able to survive and make it through all these threats. So that's why I've decided to go through the book of Romans. I think it's personally one of the greatest books in the Bible. It really is just the magnum opus of theology of the Bible. And it's had a significant impact on so many significant figures in the church throughout history. Um, Augustine, one of the great church fathers, maybe the greatest church father, he was a man who struggled with lust. He struggled with sexual sin. He struggled with wickedness. And one day he was especially bothered by his sins and he went in a garden and as he's in this garden, he heard children singing, pick it up and read it, pick it up and read it. And the children were playing a little game, but he thought the children had a message for him. And as it had just so happened that this garden that he was in on this table, on this table, there was a Bible. And he just randomly flipped open the Bible and he came to Romans 13, 1, or th excuse me, 13, 14, which says, make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. And at that very moment, Augustine surrendered his life to God. Uh, much later on in history, though no less significant, Martin Luther, a monk of the Augustinian order, happened to be struggling with faith. What is faith? How does the relationship with faith and works? He was in the Catholic Church at the time. And the book of Romans opened his eyes to see that we're justified by God's righteousness, not by our own righteousness, not by our own works. And that sparked the Reformation in Martin Luther's heart, which ended up sparking the Reformation that went around the world, which we're still imp impacted by today. So Romans is significant in so many marvelous ways. And today we're going to get into the introduction to Roman, where Paul really introduces who Jesus is and some other very important themes too. But before we get into the text, would you please join me in prayer? Um, dear Lord Jesus, thank you, God, for this day. Thank you for the book of Romans, Lord. Thank you that you chose to use the Apostle Paul to write the book of Romans, that you've shared it with us, that you've revealed incredible things to us through Romans, incredible doctrine, incredible truth. God, please speak to us all personally as we read the book of Romans. Please show us what it has to say to us. Please show it what it says to our lives. Please show us where we need to change and be made new. And please speak through your word. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we'll read the very opening verses of Romans, verses 1 to 7, which are so rich and so significant. So starting with fun, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. In this first verse, Paul identifies himself as Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Now, that word bondservant is very important. It literally means slave. The Greek word is doulos. And that Greek word doulos literally means slave. So here, 
Paul identifies himself as a slave of Jesus Christ, which is important because in our modern day, because we've seen the terrors of slavery and the absolute evil of slavery. But in Paul's day, slavery was a very different concept. The slavery of that we as a modern Americans think of compared to the slavery that Paul had in mind was radically, radically different forms of slavery. But Paul here identifies himself as a bond servant of slave. But when Paul's saying he's a slave, he's not saying that he's subjected to some sort of harsh and cruel master, but rather he says that he's a servant of this awesome master. He's a servant of God Almighty. But being a slave, he's also submitted to God. Now, there's also some significance in Paul identifying himself as a slave, as doulos, because that word doulos has a root in the Hebrew word ebed Yahweh. And ebed Yahweh was a title given to, which literally means servant of the Lord. And this title was given to people like Moses, Joshua, uh, Isaiah, the prophets, all in scripture, all these significant characters that we find in the Old Testament took this title of servant of the Lord. And here, Paul identifies himself in that same tradition as a servant of the Lord. And this is important because Paul is showing that he's not some sort of radical revolutionary coming up with his own version of a gospel. But rather, Paul is showing that the gospel he preaches here in Romans is consistent with and in fulfillment of the gospel promises made in the Old Testament now revealed here in the New. And in a sense, Paul is even superior in authority to the people of the Old Testament because he is making known the mysteries that they proclaimed. He's making known the revelation that they had not yet fully understood. In that sense, Paul's an even greater servant of the Lord than the fantastic prophets and leaders of the Old Testament who came before him. And then Paul goes on to say, called to be an apostle. And this is important. Apostolic, the apostolic office is important for a number of reasons. And to me, the number one reason is because that's how we can come to scripture, how we can come to a book like Romans and believe it is the word of God. It all has to do with apostleship. In the Old Testament, the prophets wrote as men inspired by God. They literally wrote the words of God. And that's clear when you look at the fulfilled prophecy seen all throughout Scripture. Um, there's countless fulfilled prophecies, and that's not the point of today's message. But that's how we can know that the Old Testament was inspired. These prophets spoke by God, and we also know that Jesus affirmed the authority of the Old Testament. But likewise, Jesus gave authority to the apostles that the, the same authority that the prophets of the Old Testament had. So just as the prophets of the Old Testament spoke for God, just as God communicated his divine revelation through the prophets of the Old Testament, so likewise, Jesus gave that same authority to the apostles to communicate his word to us. So when we go to scriptures, when the script to the scriptures, we can know that it is God's inspired and written word because we know that it's written by an apostle or an apostolic emissary, somebody who was working with an apostle, somebody who was under an apostle. For instance, Acts and Luke are written by Luke, who was not technically an apostle, but he was working with the apostles. He was in line with the apostles. And that's so important because we can trust our Bibles today knowing it's written by an apostle. Paul then goes on to say that he's separated to the gospel of God. And this is where things get really important because Paul's introducing the theme of his book, the theme of Romans, the gospel of God, the message of salvation, the message that us sinners separated from God can come to know him through his son, Jesus Christ. That's the gospel of God that Paul goes on to so deeply elaborate on in this entire book of Romans. And that is the introduction. That's where he starts off showing you where he's going. If you look at verse two, it says, Paul writes, which he promised, so the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Verses like these are of utmost importance, especially in our modern day, 
Because in our modern day, we've seen incredible attacks come upon the Old Testament. We've seen people try to say that the God of the Old Testament and the Father of Jesus Christ are somehow different, or the commands of the Old Testament are no longer relevant or important for the modern day Christian living in the New Covenant, or that the Old Testament wasn't even inspired, that it's just this antiquated document. But we find in the writings of the New Testament a radically different idea than that we find in contemporary liberal theology. In the New Testament, we find that the Old Testament scriptures are the promise of what was to come. The Old Testament scriptures are equal to that of the New. And one of the primary purposes Paul wrote the book of Romans was to show that the gospel which he preached, what he called my gospel, the gospel of God, was consistent, compatible, and in fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures. What the prophet Isaiah and Jeremiah and Amos and Hosea, what they all promised has come to fulfillment in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul wants to show. That's what Paul here intends to reveal to all of us. And it's so incredibly important. And we shouldn't just think that when Paul says the Old Testament, he's merely referring, uh, excuse me, the prophets, he's merely referring to the major and minor prophets that one typically thinks of when he says the prophets. But Paul is rather referring to the entire Old Testament. Moses was called a prophet. He wrote the Torah, the law. David was called a prophet. He wrote the Psalms. There's so many different prophets who technically aren't classified as one of the major or minor prophets, but that's the whole Old Testament. It's all, in a sense, prophecy about the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Now, verse 3 is very important because Paul introduces the person of Jesus Christ and his incredible significance and ultimately who he is. Paul writes, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh. Now, this is where the scriptures really start to get deep. And before I'd ever really done an in-depth study on Romans, I've always looked at verses 1 to 7 as just Paul's general introduction, just kind of read them over quickly, as most people do, and not that much of it. But there's so much richness in this introduction and it's actually unusual for Paul to make such a rich and theologically deep introduction. In most of his other epistles, it's a very brief introduction. It, it, grace and peace, and I'm Paul, an apostle called by Jesus Christ. He does all that. But then he usually just goes on to his message. But here, Paul spends an extended amount of time in the introduction because he's getting at a key theological theme. He's introducing us to the person of Jesus Christ. He's introducing us to who Jesus is. And he starts off by calling him God's son. Now, this is significant here because Paul first calls him his son. And then he tells that he was born of the seed of David. So Paul first addresses Christ as the preexistent God, the son. And then he addresses Christ as the man who, as the God who became man, the incarnate son of God. Now, have you ever asked yourself why the New Testament describes Jesus as the son of God? What does it really mean? It's a really wonderful question. It's a wonderful title. And it's a title of incredible importance because the Son of God, when Jesus is called the Son of God, it tells us that he himself is God. He's not a Son of God. He refers to himself as the Son of God. Jesus says that he is of the very same essence, the very same nature of the Father from whom he proceeds. Jesus, if you believe that the only Father of Jesus, which is what the New Testament teaches, is God, then logically you're bound to conclude that when Jesus calls himself the son of God, he can only be calling himself God. And thus when Jesus repeatedly all throughout the New Testament refers to himself as the son of God, he is referring to himself as divine. Now, you'll notice here in the verse where it says concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, it seems that Paul is hinting at the pre-existent state of Jesus as son. He is eternally son. And then he takes on flesh. He becomes incarnate as the seed of David. 
Now, that's very significant because in the Old Testament, it was promised that the Messiah would come through the seed of David, that the Messiah would reign upon David's throne eternally. And nobody had done it, and, and, and it had not yet been fulfilled until Jesus came. And this continues to prove Paul's point. Paul is showing that his gospel is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. And here we see that the Messiah, who was promised to be of the seed of David in the Old Testament, is indeed Jesus Christ, as he is the seed of David. That's the richness of the Old Testament being fulfilled in the New. And then Paul goes on to talk about a perhaps even deeper theme. He says that Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Now, I think that this is probably one of the most significant verses in all of Romans. It really unleashes to us the significance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus existed eternally as the Son of God. He existed eternally as the divine Logos, as he's referred to in John 1. But he wasn't declared to be the Son of God to all of humanity till he became incarnate in human flesh. Once he became incarnate in human flesh through his works, his miracles, his exorcisms, his healings, his preaching, he revealed himself to be the Son of God. And all those things were revelation of who he was. But the most significant revelation of who he was, namely the Son of God, came at his resurrection. When Jesus resurrected from the grave, he showed to us who he truly is. He showed to us that he truly is God. And the resurrection is significant not only because of that, but the resurrection is significant for a number of reasons. The resurrection secures our salvation. When Jesus died on the cross, he died for our sins. He died to make salvation possible for all mankind. But when he rose from the grave, he made sure that that, was, that salvation, which he died on the cross for, was accomplished in his physical resurrection from the grave. The resurrection also secures the promise we have of a physical resurrection. The Bible tells us that in the new heavens and the new earth, we'll have physical bodies. This, this current physical body that I have will be the physical body I will have in the new heaven and new earth, but it'll be made perfect. It'll be glorified. And by Jesus being a first fruit as him rising from the dead in, a phys in his physical body, he secures that promise for us as well, that there will be a physical resurrection. The resurrection is further significant, as Antti Wright has pointed out, because there's a strong connection between the covenant promises of God made to Israel and resurrection. So when Jesus resurrected, it was God showing his people that his covenant promises were being fulfilled. And once again, we see Paul's theme that the gospel he preached, the gospel which was centered around the person Jesus Christ, was consistent in fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures. And that's one of the key themes in the entire book of Romans, one of the key purposes of the entire book of Romans. Now, there's one more very significant aspect of the resurrection, and that is that the resurrection is a Trinitarian work. The entire Trinity was involved in the resurrection. God the Father was involved in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave. We read that in Acts 3.15 where Peter says that God raised the author of life from the dead after he had been killed. Jesus was involved in his resurrection. Jesus said in John 2.19, destroy this temple, referring to his body, and in three days I will raise it up again. So we see that the Father raised Jesus from the dead, the Son raised himself from the dead, and then here in Romans 1.4, we read that, the, that Jesus was raised from the dead according to the spirit of holiness. So the Holy Spirit was intricately involved in raising Jesus from the dead. And thus we see that all three members of the Trinity took part in raising Jesus from the dead. And likewise, I think we can say that all three members of the Trinity will have an intricate part in our physical resurrection. And they clearly have all an intricate part in our personal salvation. It's Jesus by whom we're saved. It's the Father who calls us. It's the Holy Spirit who comes into our hearts and sanctifies us.
So we see this Trinitarian model all throughout the scriptures in the resurrection of Jesus and our own personal salvation. And we see it clearly elaborated here in the Pauline epistle of Romans. Paul then goes on to say, through him, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Now here we find a very important word. Paul introduces us to the word grace. Paul says through him, that is Jesus Christ, we have received grace. Now, it's interesting, if you really consider it, the gospel, the essence of the gospel, the nature of the gospel, if you really just get to what the gospel is, the gospel is grace. It's about God saving those who don't deserve it. And that's what grace is. That's really truly what the gospel is. And we see that this grace comes through Jesus Christ. It's through Jesus Christ in this grace that all things are restored. Now, Thomas Aquinas, the great uh, Catholic philosopher and theologian, he made an interesting point on this. He noted that just as all things were created by the Son, so all things shall be restored by the Son through grace. Look at what Thomas Aquinas says. He notes, for it is fitting that just as all things were made by the word, that is Jesus, so by the word, as by the art of God Almighty, all things should be restored. Just as in the beginning, Jesus was the rational agent behind which the entire creation was made to be. So Jesus is the person by whom salvation and grace are given to all of us. Grace is the essence of the gospel. Karl Barth, the great German, well, Swiss German theologian, he noted that only when grace is recognized to be incomprehensible is it grace. And we truly have to wrap our minds around it. We've heard so many sermons about grace, 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 grace. And oftentimes it's a very cheap grace, a grace that doesn't cost us anything. But when we think about grace, it truly is an incomprehensible thing. And only when it's realized to be incomprehensible. Can you be said to truly have received it? If you don't realize the incomprehensibility of grace, the ineffability of what grace is, you can't have truly received it. It's only when one realizes the infinite God has come into finite flesh to die for us that we might know him who has everything in himself being Trinitarian. He loves the members of the Trinity, give themselves everything they need. That's when grace truly becomes amazing. That's when grace truly becomes unbelievably powerful beyond all that we can think of or compare to. That grace that is unlimited and amazing, it truly is an awesome grace. Now, Paul says something interesting here. He says we have received grace, and he also says apostleship. Now, there's the specific sense of an apostle in the sense of those who were called by Jesus, who had visions of Jesus, the essential criteria of being an apostle was actually seeing the Lord physically and who were sent and commissioned specifically by Jesus to preach the gospel to all nations, write scripture. One thinks of, of course, Paul, Peter, James, the 12 apostles. But there's also a general sense of apostleship in which all of us are truly apostles in the sense of we're all sent out into the world to preach the good news. The Greek word apostolos just means the one sent out. And that's what we are. We're sent out by God to give the to do the great commission to preach the gospel and baptize all people amongst all nations. And in that sense, we also are called to the apostleship. Not in the sense of a special calling like Paul had. But in a general sense, which we all share, and that's an honor and a privilege. God doesn't need us to share his word. God doesn't need us at all. But yet he calls us into apostleship to share his word, and that's truly a beautiful gift. Now then Paul goes on to continue. He says that through him we've received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith. Now there's some debate as to what this term, analogy, obedience to the faith means. Does it mean that we're acting in obedience to God's command to put faith in him? Or does it mean that it's the obedience which flows from faith? And I tend to uh, believe it's the latter interpretation. Faith comes first, but obedience is a necessary result of faith. 
You can't separate the two. They're not two separate. They, in a sense, they're two separate things, but in a sense, they're not. They're inextricably intertwined. Once you are saved by faith, you must show that you have been saved through acts of obedience to God's word. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Faith always results in work. John Calvin said, faith alone saves, but the faith that saves is never alone. And the question is, in your life, is there obedience? Is there submission to God? Total and complete. Because if it's only partial, it means nothing to God. Is there total and complete obedience to Christ? Because if there's not, it means that you haven't truly stepped out in faith. It's a very easy test. Is your life an act of obedience to God? Does the obedience flow from you that should, if you have truly put your faith in Christ? Back to that word grace. Grace is not cheap. It's a grace that costs us our lives. Christ died on the cross that we might receive his grace. And when we receive that grace, we have to surrender our lives to God and live out that grace in our everyday life. Grace costs us everything. Grace means dying to ourselves and living alive to God. That's what grace is. And that's what we have to live out. And that's what Paul means by obedience to faith obedience from faith. Then Paul says, among all nations for his name. This is a message which goes among all nations. Originally, when Jesus came, many of his own disciples thought that this salvation message, this gospel, was only for the Jews, for the Jewish people. And Paul does note later on in Romans that it was for the Jew first, but it's also for the Gentile. This gospel message has been shared with us who are not part of the Jewish covenant, who are, who are not part of God's original covenant family, but we've been grafted in, we've been adopted into this family because of God's grace. And then Paul says something amazing. He says that it's for his name. And I use the NKJV translation, but uh, personally, I prefer it when the translations say for his name's sake. I think that's the best translation because that's what we're doing it for. At the end of the day, Paul isn't preaching this message just so people come to know God. That's an, of an utmost importance. But the primary reason Paul preaches this message of Jesus Christ, the primary reason Paul reveals to us who Jesus is, the preexistent son made incarnate in flesh, resurrected from the grave, the primary reason he does this is for zeal for God, for his name's sake. Um, one commentator very aptly put it. It's a really beautiful quote. He noted that the highest of missionary motives is neither obedience to the Great Commission, important as that is, nor love for sinners who are alienated and perishing, strong as that incentive is, especially when we contemplate the wrath of God, but rather zeal, burning and passionate zeal, for the glory of Jesus Christ. At the end of the day, that is the reason why we as Christians do what we do. It's not for our own glory. It's not for our own praise. It's not for our own credit, obviously. But it's not even for necessarily, like the author noted, fulfillment of the Great Commission or to get sinners saved from hell. Those are all important. Those are very, very important secondary reasons. But the primary reason we do it is zeal for Christ that burns within us, a zeal to obey him, a zeal to do what he has commanded, a zeal to go out for his name's sake and see that his name is hallowed and honored. That's at the end of the day why we do it, for his name's sake. Paul then goes on to note, talking to the Roman believers, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, Romans, being such a significantly doctrinal book, touches on the topic of election and predestination uh, rather heavily, in specifically in Romans, the latter end of Romans 8 and in Romans 9. And we'll get into election in depth there. We'll get into predestination, we'll get into all the different views, and we'll, we'll cover it deeply. But here, there's just a little hint at what Paul's going to talk about as he notes calling. He says, you are the called of Jesus Christ. Now, um, Calvinists who believe in a kind of exhaustive, determinative predestination like to make a distinction between a general calling, which is given unto everybody, and then an effectual calling, which is given only 
to the elect. And personally, I reject that distinction. I tend to be, uh, I, I'm of a system of uh, theology as a pertains to salvation, salvation, kind of a Molinist Arminian theology there. And I reject that. I believe in a corporate call given unto all. But here, Paul does touch on something very important, calling. All of us, I believe, are called unto salvation. And these Roman believers answered that call. And the question is, have you answered the call? The call really is given unto all of us, whether you believe it in some sort of distinctive distinction between the two calls or whatever. There is a general call, undoubtedly, unto all people. And we have to answer that call. And here we see that the Roman Christians had answered that call. And there may be something significant else in this, in that the Romans were mainly, gen the Roman audience that Paul's writing to is mainly Gentiles. So Paul is praising, in a sense, these Gentiles who had answered the call of Christ when so many of the Jewish people had not. The chance is there for all of us, whether Jew or Roman, to answer the call of Christ. Paul then ends saying, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's interesting how Paul opens with grace and peace. He says, grace to you and peace. In typical, Paul lived in a Hellenistic period. The Hellenists were people heavily influenced by, they're typically Jewish, who were heavily influenced by Greek thinking, Greek philosophy. And the Hellenists typically opened their letters and their rhetorical arguments, all sorts of things like that, with the term greetings. But Paul replaced that typical Hellenistic emphasis with greetings with grace. Paul greeted all his listeners with grace, just thus emphasizing the message of the gospel, grace, grace, grace through Jesus Christ. But then Paul also includes peace. And peace was a typical opening in Jewish writing. Jews would typically open with peace. So thus Paul takes both grace and peace and puts them together. And the order is not insignificant. Grace comes first and the inevitable result of that grace is a peace. Thus, if one has peace with God, one has received that grace. But if one does not have peace with God, if when you lie on your bed, you worry about the prospect of spending eternity in hell, if you lie awake without peace, it's because you haven't received that grace. If you have received that grace, the inevitable and indubitable result is peace. Peace that passes all understanding. Thomas Aquinas said that through grace and peace, all the gifts in between are understood. Those are two of the most significant things. For the essence of the gospel is grace, and the res inevitable result of receiving the gospel is peace. And that is what we all desperately need, peace with God. Paul then finally ends, he praises God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in the epistles of the apostles in the gospels, we find that the all the apostles do something significant. And not always, but oftentimes. They use the word theos, which is the usual word for God, to describe God the Father. And they use the word kyrios, which means Lord, for Jesus Christ. Now, the word kyrios, which translates Lord in the English, can mean a number of things. It can, it can be as simple as just calling someone sir. You could just say kyrios, and it essentially means sir or mister, something like that. But in the Septuagint, and the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which preceded the apostles by hundreds of years. Um, it, it came around a long time before Jesus came on the scene, the Septuagint. The word used for the covenant name of God, Yahweh, in Hebrew, was translated in the Greek, Kyrios. So God's name, which literally means is, the name Yahweh means is, God's name, his covenant name, his special name, the name given only to him, was always translated Kyrios, Lord. And of course, the apostle Paul was aware of that. So when Paul and the apostles say the Lord Jesus Christ, Kyrios, they're referring to Jesus as Yahweh. They're referring to Jesus as the eternal God. And that's so important because it reminds us once again that all throughout scripture, we see this theme of the Trinity, 
And we see this theme of who Jesus is. He is God Almighty. He is the God man, God incarnate. And it's through this letter that Paul begins to elaborate on who Jesus is and what the gospel of Jesus truly means, how we can live it out and apply it. Well, that's the end of our message today. I really hope you enjoyed it. I hope there's lots to contemplate. Before we end, would you please join me in a word of prayer? Um, dear Lord Jesus, thank you, God, for your word. Thank you for writing your word to us, God. You didn't have to reveal your word to us, but God, you chose to reveal your word to us. God, thank you for grace, the grace that you offer all of us, grace through your son, Jesus Christ. God, I pray for those watching who haven't received your grace and thus who don't have peace. God, help them to come to reach out and call out for that grace, to ask for your grace, to beg you, God, for mercy and forgiveness. And I pray for those watching who do know you, Lord. Please anoint them and cover them in your grace. Give them a special sense of peace, Lord. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining me, guys. I'll see you next time.